we're going to go to our panel of respondents uh, who uh, I'll give each, each of you five minutes right off the top and, uh, and um, uh, handle this with martial discipline uh, as well uh, to give everybody a chance to speak and then we will have a, a discussion uh, between us uh, and uh, uh, then uh, give the audience a chance to respond as well. <clears throat> I'm going to go uh, in the order of our seating up here and uh, begin with uh, Jocelyn uh, and uh, I'll give you a chance to um, uh, respond uh, particularly to this uh, question of uh, did poverty win? Okay. Thank you and uh, good morning. Uh, it's terrific to be here uh, with such a uh, a terrific, uh, distinguished panel. And uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Sheldon and Martha for such a great book um, and for really um, discussing in detail uh, uh, a lot of the impact of the war on poverty. And I, I think what I'd like to do is focus uh, a little bit on the lessons that we can learn from the war on poverty. And so my first answer to your question is, you know, did we, did the war win? Um, I, I think that that's, uh, I'm going to sort of talk a, a little bit um, uh, on an offshoot of that question because I don't think the, the war is over. Um, I think what the book does in a very compelling way is make it clear that important progress has been made um, and that we shouldn't discount that progress. And the fact that we haven't won um, doesn't mean that the war was a failure. Um, uh, I think it just means that it, uh, it's a difficult war to win. Um, and so the question on the table is, what steps do we really need to take to continue the progress that has been made? Um, and while I don't love the war analogy, um, uh, uh, what I understand about war or conflict is that, uh, you know, in any sort of engagement, uh, conditions change. Um, you've got to be able to change as the conditions change. You need to be able to tweak the strategies that you deployed. You need to be able to deploy new strategies. Um, and you need to be in it for the long haul. Um, you can't sort of get, get out when, when it gets difficult or hard. Um, and to me, that's one of the important uh, legacies that we ought to think about. But when you look at um, particularly President Johnson's speech and you look at um, the way that the book sort of in a very comprehensive way talks about the range of programs involved with the war in poverty, it seems to me there are at least five takeaways that I think are instructive in terms of where we need to go um, today. Um, the first is that the, the war on poverty was rooted in our nation's values around um, individual dignity, around equality, and that one of the clear goals of, of uh, President Johnson's program was to make real uh, the promise of equality and fairness, to, to demonstrate concretely what we as a nation needed to do in order to make um, all of our values felt equally by all of our citizens. The second thing is that he took a comprehensive approach. And while I suppose there's a lot of debate about sort of what the scope should have looked like, um, I think what's important is is that he understood that there wasn't a one-size-fits-all solution, that uh, tackling poverty meant doing a number of things. It meant investments around education. It meant health care. It meant social security. It meant looking from uh, um, the uh, young people in their earliest years and making sure that kids get a healthy start in life all the way to the end and looking at our seniors. And I think that comprehensive framework is one that's still relevant today. Uh, the third thing he did in Martha spoke about this is that he recognized as a core policy matter that equality was inextricably linked to poverty um, and that entrenched barriers to um, uh, 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 equality often have as a side effect persistent um, poverty uh, and persistent economic insecurity. And so he framed um, the strategy around tackling equality as a fundamental economic policy initiative. Um, and I think that's important today. Um, we often talk about those issues in silos, but um, the reality is that um, our efforts to ensure equality for all Americans is fundamentally related to our ability to have a strong uh, economy, and, and it should be considered an economic strategy and not simply a nice thing to do. The fourth thing I think is important is that he understood he had a fight on his hand. He called it a war for a reason. He understood that you know you can't just pass a bunch of laws and then hope that 
that um, everything turns out right, that he did have to leverage the power of the federal government, that it was important to, to make it clear that he understood he was fighting against something, that there were interests in preserving the status quo, and that, um, that it wasn't going to be as easy as simply hoping that uh, um, once you put laws in place that they would actually work, just work um, uh, unconditionally. Um, and lastly, and I think this is important, uh, is that he understood that uh, um, everybody had a role to play. People present the war in poverty as simply a bunch of government solutions. But if you look at his speech, he explicitly said otherwise. He understood the government had a role to play, but it wasn't just government, that uh, everybody needed to come to the table. Uh, I think those principles are important as we look forward, um, because I think they, they can shape and pro provide a framework for progress that we need to make today. Uh, and I know we'll get into more detail, but um, it seems to me that the conditions have changed. The conditions that were present 50 years ago are clearly different today. And at least the, some of the areas that I think that we need to focus on in uh, continuing the progress that was made um, need to focus on quality jobs. Um, as I think Sheldon mentioned, the jobs that are being grown today, many of those are low-wage jobs and are, are simply not able to provide people the economic um, standard that we need. So a focus on uh, jobs that actually are, are better jobs um, is an important investment. A focus on living wages, decent wages wages, Ra clearly raising the minimum wage, but efforts around the country to actually think about what a living wage really looks like, and making sure that people are paid fairly for their work. So the work around equal pay um, is, is a critical proponent, particularly for women, because one of the biggest changes that has happened is the influx of women into the workforce. Um, in, uh, continued investments in early childhood education um, and ensuring that kids have the best start in life. So uh, discussions around universal pre-K and um, improving the quality of child care is essential. And the last thing that I will say um, is continued investments in uh, and vigilance around uh, um, eradicating discrimination. Um, uh, people often forget about the importance of investments in civil rights enforcement, but it's very much connected to the ability of everybody to have an equal chance to succeed in the workplace. Um, the very last thing I will say is that despite all the, the, the critique about the war on poverty, um, I think there's a lot of support nationally for um, taking and pursuing a lot of these strategies. Uh, the center, um, through the Half and Ten program just released some polling that showed that nearly 70% of Americans support a new war on poverty. And I think that should um, um, embolden us to uh, make those uh, the changes that we need to really uh, continue to move forward. So thank you. And thank you. Well, Kevin Hassett, uh, has this emboldened you to move forward? And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, on that question of, uh, of uh, whether uh, poverty won, how do you feel about that? Oh yeah. So, so did poverty win? And, and you mentioned that I've been a critic of uh, income uh, inequality analyses in the space. And and I can say that the uh, Council of Economic Advisors put out a report last night uh, that uh, looked at the same topic that we're discussing today and had a very measured uh, and, and academically credible discussion of the debates that we've been having. Uh, maybe Sheldon and I over more than a decade. Uh, uh, now uh, that, that about how to measure it and, and how to judge our progress. And, and I think that, uh, that we know that uh, if we look at consumption rather than income, then the story can often be quite radically different in terms of how much progress uh, we're making. Uh, and that uh, so while income inequality has skyrocketed, uh, I have a paper called A New Measure of Consumption Inequality with the Parna Mature that came out about a year ago, uh, where we plot consumption Gini coefficients and show that they've not really budged much at all. And I think that in part, while income inequality can increase, if income inequality can increase and consumption inequality is not increasing nearly as much or maybe much if at all, uh, then that means that there's both a, a war on poverty and really a kind of war on inequality. Uh, that's going on, that there are transfers uh, either through high marginal rates on the rich or uh, middle class uh, programs that subsidize middle class consumption, which is like Social Security might be an example, uh, disability uh, might be another example. Uh, but, but if you stipulate that the consumption inequality analysis that we've been doing for years that suggests that people are, are doing uh, better than you might think if you look just at income inequality, uh, then you have to concede that that consumption is being bolstered by a lot of these programs, the transfer programs. And so, and so uh, if you think, you know, and partly I think that, that Sheldon overstates the decoupling from growth, I'll talk about that in a second, but if you think that consumption is holding up a lot better than you might have expected, uh, given that income hasn't 
then then it must be the collectively these programs are having a big effect uh, just, and, 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 so, and so therefore the war on poverty it must be helping people maintain uh, consumption just uh, to clarify you're saying because people have uh, cell phones and uh, uh, VCI, so well, like, well, you see it in measured measures. consumption, but but you also see it in in terms of the and this is a thought experiment that Aparna and I play, uh, which we're able to play because of the Residential Energy Conservation Survey, which is this great survey which basically goes into people's homes and and writes down everything that they've got in their house, you know, seven hundred something variables. Uh, and and if you look at that, uh, one of the things that I find striking is that if you believe, for example, the wage chart. Uh, that says real wages haven't increased in 40 years, then what that means is that if you were to, if you really had measured what, what wealth, you know, welfare correctly with your, with your price index that's me measuring the real wage, then it ought to be that we could take a random person today and say, hey, I'll, I'll let you uh, trade your current circumstances, the house you live in, the stuff you've got, for one 40 years ago, for, for, for a house with stuff 40 years ago, and they should be indifferent, right, if the real wage really hadn't grown. Uh, and, and that was the relevant metric of their welfare. Uh, but if you actually look at how the houses have changed and what's inside them and the percentage of people that, that have heating and air conditioning and washer dryers and things like that, there's nobody would, even people below the poverty line would be very irate if you tried to make them take that trade. Uh, and, and I think that that's a challenge for measuring things. And I know I don't have a lot of time, but I, I wanted to say that going forward though, I agree that there's a lot of hard work that we have to do in terms of policy design. And I wanted to list a few areas, and, and I think in, in this, I might be in much more agreement uh, with Sheldon. I think that first, uh, while I don't think that the, the growth uh, uh, welfare of the, of the poor uh, nexus has broken, the way Sheldon says, I think that, that there's a risk that going forward it might be more broken than it has been because we have a serious problem of long-term unemployment, and the long-term unemployed are really hard to reconnect uh, to society as the society grows. Uh, and, and so I think that going forward, we've, we've not done a good job of thinking about how we can reconnect the long-term unemployed uh, to society. We know that that's a very, very hard problem and we're, we're not really doing much to do it. And that was one of Sheldon's bullet points and that would be one of, one of my top priorities. I think the second thing is that we need to recognize that we've kind of undone welfare reform. I think if the ultimate objective is the hand up, which I think there was a lot of bipartisan agreement about and I think President Clinton uh, I, I think in the end supported uh, reforms that, that had a big positive effect uh, on lives, many lives. And I think that we've kind of undone them by uh, spreading the idea of welfare out, uh, outside, like into the tax code through the ITC. And, and, and uh, that if you look at, there was a Hamilton event a few weeks ago that talked about the ridiculously high marginal tax rates that especially second earners uh, face uh, because they lose benefits if they go out and get a job. Uh, and you can often get tax rates above 100%. And so we've really discouraged work uh, for low and middle income people with, the, with high marginal rates uh, with this new construction that we have where we have, have a lot of welfare programs that are sort of outside of the welfare program that we revised to encourage work more. And we're really discouraging work a lot. Uh, and, and we need to think about the, the Hamilton proposal, what was to have a refundable credit for second earners and things like that. But we need to explore policies like that because we're discouraging work so much. And it's not necessarily the case that we built something that's a hand up. The third thing I think is that if you look at a really, really big challenge that, that we have in terms of poverty, uh, that you, you'd have to say that geographic variation is enormous. Uh, and that there are pockets like Detroit, but it's not just Detroit, where, where things are, are really intensely awful. Uh, and that in the past, there was strong bipartisan support for things like enterprise zones, but, but I think there's wide agreement that the designs they tried in the past didn't work. And I think that the challenge going forward is to think about the, this geographic variation and what kind of policies we can develop uh, to address it. And, and finally, I, I would say that uh, uh, and this goes to, to something in, in uh, Martha and uh, Sheldon's work uh, that, or in the book that, that, I, that I would want to acknowledge, which is that while, while uh, the racial discrimination was a really big focus uh, right at the outset for President Johnson and that, that the relative poverty has declined, it's still the case that the poverty rate for African Americans is more than double by just about any measure. Uh, what, and, and so, and so, so while there's progress, there's still like a radical, if, when, when something's off by an integer multiple, then there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and, and so I think that feeling, so while there's been progress made on that, we need to think about why we haven't made enough. And so that, that's what I would say. Thank you, very, very valid points. Uh, I'm sure Jason's got a thing or two to say about that. Yeah. Well, uh, I was struck in this book, um, as I think most readers would be, by the, the disconnect between the um, policy record that it, it details and the political verdict that's accompanied it. Um, 
you know, if you read the book, you you may see that there's missteps or disappointments, but also uh, real progress on a variety of fronts: housing, healthcare, nutrition, access to education. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nuanced uh, look at a mixed record, but the political uh, verdict on the war on poverty isn't nuanced at all. It's widely shared, I think, and wholly negative, as as summed up uh, by Ronald Reagan's devastating quip um, that we fought a war on poverty and poverty won. Uh, you know, the very phrase "war on poverty" is used, I think, not only to uh, discredit government action uh, on the poor, but government action uh, in general, or certainly federal government uh, action. Um, so if it's true, as um, Bailey and Danziger argued, that poverty rates are much lower today than they would have been had the war on poverty never been declared, um, the question becomes, why, is, why did the effort get such a bad rap? Uh, I want to use most of my five minutes to, to consider a few possibilities, uh, but, but let me spend 30 seconds or so, um, for those of you who haven't looked at the book yet, to, to um, give you a sense of some of what they cite uh, uh, as legacies of the war on poverty. Uh, an expansion of maternal health programs, a dramatic in, uh, and an accompanying dramatic reduction in infant mortality, uh, the creation of a Head Start program that's been shown to lengthen school attainment and bolster college attendance, a dramatic decline in the official poverty rate of the elderly, the creation of what became the Pell Grant <coughs> program, the creation of food and nutrition programs, quote, with a solid track record in reducing poverty and, in, and food insecurity, improving nutrition and yielding benefits for child health and development, um, the narrowing of disparities between rich and poor in access to health care, um, and the list goes on. So while progress may have been um, slower and more expensive than expected, and in some places the trends are going the wrong direction, um, how, how did an effort that included uh, uh, such uh, respected programs as Head Start, student loans, and Medicare uh, become the boogeyman of American politics? Um, I, I have a few possible theories. So theory one would be that the uh, authors are engaged in, in a liberal sleight of hand. Um, there's no clear definition of what is the war on poverty, and maybe this volume just lumps in some things that don't really belong there, like Medicare and student loans. Um, when people criticize the war on poverty, um, they're not criticizing uh, honor students or old people. They're uh, criticizing community action and welfare programs. So um, maybe this is simply a, 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 a confusion of terminology. Um, the second theory might be to blame the measuring stick. Um, in 1967, the official poverty rate was 14%. Now it's 15%. That certainly seems to bolster the conclusion that we fought a war on poverty and poverty won. But uh, as everyone in this room is aware, the official poverty measure is a, a deeply flawed one that leaves out um, the effects of uh, non-cash programs like housing, food assistance, wage supplements, and medical insurance. Uh, a recent estimate by Jane Wald and Fogel and her uh, colleagues found under a more expansive accounting, the poverty rate would have driven, dropped from 26% in 1967 to 16% today. 26% to 16%, a 40% reduction. Um, that's not a thrilling breakthrough, probably not as much as LBJ would have hoped for, but it's certainly um, significant progress and different from a, a picture of complete failure. You know, uh, different methodologies will, will, would give you different numbers. Uh, the measurement of poverty is very complex, as Kevin just uh, alluded to. Uh, but one thing that struck me about that number is, you know, it, it just intuitively it feels kind of right to me. Um, uh, if I think about, again, to use Kevin's thought about what it would have been like 40 years ago, you know, I don't think um, any of us would, would want to change uh, places with uh, a citizen back then. Um, so a 40% uh, yeah, you know, halfway, sort of almost halfway won the war on progress. My, my war on poverty might seem more appropriate. Theory three, uh, blame the headwinds. That's been discussed a lot here. Uh, uh, it wasn't so much what the government did, but what the government uh, came up against unexpectedly in terms of uh, the economy stopped lifting all boats, the uh, demographic trends went the wrong way, the rise of uh, single parenthood. Um, created more poverty. Um, the war on poverty didn't cause those trends, although it sometimes gets blamed for the latter. Um, but maybe it simply served, deserves credit for keeping people from losing more ground. Uh, a fourth possibility is that it just suffered from bad timing. And you know, the war on poverty was declared, and then the next thing you knew, the riots were breaking out, and um, uh, the Black Power movement grew militant, the Vietnam War grew south, uh, crime soared. By the end of Watergate, a decade later, 
faith in government had eroded. Maybe the war on poverty just gets blamed for occurring at the wrong time. You know, somewhat to, he to Kevin's point on the TANF program, I think the opposite dynamic uh, is occurred. I think TANF gets a lot of program, a lot of uh, credit for having uh, 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 been born in the late 1990s when everything seemed to go well. Um, and uh, most people haven't given it a, 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 a good second look uh, in the 10 years since when uh, it, it suffered many of the problems uh, or even worse problems than its critics predicted at the time. So maybe first impressions uh, have a lot to do with how programs are judged. Um, my last theory, I guess, about why the war on poverty uh, has become so unpopular um, is the racial theory, um, that the war on poverty is unpopular because it's largely understood as an effort to help poor black people. Um, you know, when politicians talk about the war on poverty being poor, um, again, I don't think they're summoning, or the war on poverty having failed, they're not conjuring pictures of, uh, of old ladies on, on Medicare using up too much money. Uh, I, I think they're talking about black people getting welfare checks, um, which is particularly uh, ironic when you think that LBJ hated the word so much he wouldn't call HEW um, by its real name. He called it the Department of Health and Education. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan is uh, fa famous, of course, for um, declaring the war on poverty uh, failure. Um, he's also famous for talking about the strapping young buck buying steaks with his food stamps. Um, I think a, 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 an image that leaves little doubt about what race the strapping young man was. Um, these theories, of course, are not uh, mutually uh, exclusive as to why the uh, war on poverty is so uh, unpopular. Um, but if uh, Bailey and Danziger are right, uh, and the defenders of the safety net have a, a set of partial successes, what are the lessons um, for going forward? Uh, it, as long as I've been covering poverty for the New York Times, almost 25 years, um, the left has had some version of the same debate, which is whether to talk about poverty in explicit terms and risk a kind of conservative backlash, or, or to try to help poor people on the sly and, and avoid the word poverty. You know, in the late 80s and 90s, the emphasis was on helping kids. I think we now have a conversation that's uh, largely subsumed in a debate about inequality and opportunity, which is a, a, certainly a safer word and one um, that's a more promising bridge to consensus. You know, as, as a journalist, I come down on the side of the explicit. There's tens of millions of poor Americans and their hardships run deep and they deserve a, a, a higher and more explicit place in the national conversation. Um, that's one reason why I like the book. Um, if I were a politician, I'm not sure I'd take that advice because if the war on poverty shows anything, it's that the choice of words matter of lo a lot and poverty remains a really divisive word in American politics um, while well, opportunity doesn't. Um, you know, if we do end up having a conversation about opportunity that becomes uh, uh, more productive in terms of uh, leading to policies to help low-income Americans, um, Maybe there's a, a historical footnote uh, uh, there, which is that uh, opportunity was, of course, the favored word of the architects of the war on poverty, so much so that they housed uh, their effort in an office called uh, the Office of Equal Opportunity. So maybe in that sense, we'll come full circle. Thank you. And finally, Michael, another journalist, uh, how do you feel about the, the question of did poverty win? Well, maybe I can start by adding one possible explanation to Jason's of, of why um, assessing the legacy of the war on poverty is difficult. And some of that has to do with ex the expectations that were raised. Um, after his election in 1964, uh, LBJ proclaimed that America was living in, quote, the most hopeful time since Christ was born in Bethlehem, <laughs> um, which uh, is really raised expectations pretty high and, <laughs> uh, and uh, actually placed LBJ in the manger. But, um, and this added to the expectations in the war on poverty when he said, for the first time in history, it's possible to conquer poverty. Um, and the actual results, as you'd expect, would be mixed. Um, I, I agree with the book on many things. Um, Medicare and Medicaid have become part of the fabric of American life and some of the greatest social justice achievements in American history. Um, I, Arthur Brooks, the head of AEI, now talks about how conservatives need to make peace with the safety net, and I think that that's necessary. Um, the uh, expansion of Social Security, you know, helped many elderly. Uh, food and nutrition programs, 
you know, when I talk to conservative audiences, I'll, you know, I admit, you know, the SNAP program um, encourages dependence, dependence on food, which is a different thing than, than other forms of dependence. Um, and, uh, but of course, there are things like AFDC, uh, where you had a Democratic presidential candidate make reforming it the center, one of the centerpieces of his campaign. Um, that shows how, how the shift has taken place. And then you have the federal role in, uh, in education, which people haven't really mentioned here, which I don't blame necessarily the federal role for this, but education as a whole when it comes to social mobility and opportunity is one of the great scandals of American life, the way that poor children are betrayed and continue to be, be betrayed every day in American schools. That is certainly not a success by any measure. And then there are some other elements that are such good ideas we keep trying to get them right, like Head Start, um, where it can work in some cases and it doesn't work in, in, in other cases. Um, the, um, so what have we learned here? I think it, we know how to meet the needs on a vast scale of millions of people. We don't know how to defeat poverty. Um, the, uh, the war on poverty did not end poverty or prevent the economic isolation of American cities, which was, took place in this period. And so we spend, in, as a whole in, in the nation, a trillion dollars on transfers every year. We've got 40 some million people in poverty. That's not a causation but it's a cause for disappointment and missed opportunity and a, and a call to reform. Um, so if you were making a judgment about the war on poverty in, uh, say, 1968 or 1972, it would have looked really good. It, the successes would have looked good. But that progress ran into durable social problems that are not addressed by transfers. As people talk about globalization, technology undermined decent paying blue collar jobs, and you also had social trends that undermined family structure and community health. And these are problems that are not rooted in a lack of consumption, but a lack of social capital and opportunity. And those are complex problems. So it's left a significant problem for America, a dangerously stalled social mobility for a significant number of Americans, um, which is a threat to the American ideal. Um, and that requires the ideals and effort of the great society, but the methods, I think, have to be very, very different. Um, and that's finding ways to improve the labor market, encourage work, uh, encourage workforce participation, but also finding ways to catalyze the essential role of private and civic institutions, including families, religious institutions, that give people the skills and values to succeed in a modern economy. And so I think that's another area where uh, some creativity is required. And these tasks, when you look at them, actually re require both liberals and conservatives to make contributions if our political system allows that. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, take a moment to uh, ask the uh, authors of, of, the, of this uh, book and uh, uh, as well as the, the, the oh, oh, good idea. This, this is what happens when you, when you have a, a print journal. I keep forgetting the value. <laughs> You're forgetting the value of microphones. Uh, <laughs> let me ask uh, 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 Sheldon uh, and um, uh, 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 Martha, uh, now that you've heard the responses, uh, is there anything particularly that sticks out you'd like to respond to? No, I actually, I really appreciate the comments of, of our respondents. And there's lots of things they said that really resonate. Um, I especially like the idea that um, Jocelyn brought up saying that the war analogy, I think, has been problematic for a really long time. But it's also very useful for thinking about the fact that um, the voices of the poor um, are something that's not always heard. And there are lots of um, powerful interests fighting against change. But one of the most, um, the biggest pieces, I think, um, and this, res uh, I think, um, relates to the comments of one of the other um, panelists, is that there was tremendous resistance to civil rights and integration. This was not a popular program. This is something that got Johnson into a lot of trouble. So 
these types of initiatives, I think, are tremendously useful. And thinking about this as a war analogy, I've never liked that much, but I actually liked your comment a lot, thinking about how useful that is. It's still something that I think um, is worth thinking about today. Uh, Sheldon? Just a couple of comments. Um, on the broad definition of the war on poverty that uh, Martha and I emphasize in the book, um, I don't think uh, Jason was uh, convinced, but when he said, is it liberal sleight of hand? And what we try to do in the book is to say, uh, Johnson uh, set out all the broad goals in the January 8th speech 50 years ago today. And it's on Martha's second slide. So um, assisting the aged and disabled and improving the nation's health was front and center to the war in poverty. And, uh, there were 11 goals in the, the chapter uh, which, which uh, accompanied uh, the speech. And so, um, and again, meant, uh, I, I agreed very much with uh, some of the things uh, that Michael was saying, improving labor markets uh, was one of them. So I think from the very beginning, uh, the, uh, this broad definition uh, was part of it. I, I want to mention one thing on Kevin and consumption, uh, and again, because of time. What I didn't get to say, because I was uh, uh, of the time limit was uh, we went from a period in this golden age when a rising tide lifted all boats when male earnings were the engine of economic growth to a period in which it's been the rising wages and work of women. So the reason families are better off today, I'm not saying families are not better off today, that's also on that slide is because women's share of family income has made up for what one would have expected from male economic growth. So I, I certainly agree um, uh, uh, about uh, consumption inequality being less than income inequality. And your implication is exactly right. One of the reasons consumption inequality is uh, higher is because uh, spending on food from food stamps and spending on health care uh, from uh, Medicare and Medicaid are included. But in general, I, uh, I appreciate um, uh, the comments uh, from all of the um, panelists and, and uh, would agree that it would, be, um, it would be a very optimistic time. Uh, one would have to go back, I think, to the period of President Ford when uh, conservatives and liberals sat down and uh, tried to say, how can we work together uh, to solve the problems of, of poverty and an opportunity? And uh, liberals would agree that there are some programs that could be gotten rid of, and uh, conservatives could agree that there are some programs in the safety net. I think you quoted the term, make peace with the safety net, uh, that have been uh, very successful, and how do we move forward? And the key thing is, how do we move forward uh, to raise the wages and employment opportunities of those at the bottom of the labor market? I, I love this notion of private institutions. It would be wonderful if there were private institutions that hire millions of workers that would decide, oh, the Costco model is the model that we want to follow. and. Uh, instead of having their workers rely on the public sector, uh, they would raise the wages um, of uh, uh, private sector. So I think that a lot of change has gone on, uh, not just in government programs, but in the behavior of uh, private employers. Thank you. I've got several Clarence, questions. Can I, let, me, uh, let me jump in just, just, okay. just a second, I, I, um, just to clarify. That's a problem um, working with journalists on the panel. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should have said, uh, um, Martha and Sheldon provide a very detailed and um, persuasive explanation for what they include in the war on poverty. I wasn't, um, I didn't mean to uh, uh, imply that I was criticizing what they included. I'm saying that part of the reason you get such a different verdicts about the war on poverty is different constituencies have different programs in mind, and there is no clear definition. So the people who are attacking the war on poverty aren't attacking, I don't think, for the whole, most part, 
Medicare or student loans um, uh, or nutrition programs they're attacking another set of programs. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, I'd like to zoom in on this issue of consumption for a moment uh, without getting too wonky. Uh, because if I knew anything about math, I wouldn't have been a journalism major. I'll be, I'll, I'll be very upfront about that. Uh, but I'm going to ask uh, Kevin to uh, 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 elaborate on, uh, on the question of uh, just um, what, whether there has been a consumption gap or not. In other words, uh, has uh, uh, consumption by the poor uh, continued uh, uh, to, at a, a high pace despite uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, income gap. Uh, th there's been some questions uh, by some other studies, and uh, th this is where we get wonky. Uh, in other words, some studies that disagree with, with your finding in regard to uh, uh, the difference there. And how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, there, there's some discussion about whether the in income is, a, is better, better measured than consumption and whether uh, different uh, subsets of the consumer expenditure survey are more accurate, and if you sort of throw some stuff out, you can find measures of consumption that uh, don't, th th where, where the consumption inequality has increased more than you see if you use the broader measure that we use. But I think that, again, if you look at the, the Council of Economic Advisors report yesterday and, and, and also like my discussion with Martha, I think we, we all kind of concede that, that consumption inequality at the very least has increased a lot less mm -hmm. than income inequality, and maybe not much at all. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the maybe not much at all part would be if you think that the measure that Aparna and I chose, which is a very broad measure, was a good one. The, the one thing I wanted to say to add to the discussion that just happened, which is, is somewhat related to this, is, is that I wanted to circle back a little bit to the idea that there's both been a kind of war on poverty, and I, and I, I agree that maybe using war is uh, inviting uh, people not to work together as soon because then you don't care about poverty if you're opposed to war on poverty. I don't know, but but I think that the war on inequality uh, is, is a really relevant factor when you think about how can we spend a trillion dollars and then have 40 million people left over still in poverty? Say if that's the way you want to ask the question, well then the obvious answer is just arithmetic is well you must be giving some of that money to people who don't need it, right? Maybe, or or to people who aren't the the poor. Uh, and if you think about, for example, uh, President Bush's prescription drug program. Incredibly costly. Present value of the cost of that was bigger than the present value of the cost of Social Security by the estimates at the time. Uh, a lot of the beneficiaries of that are not people that are poor. Uh, but it was very, very costly. And I think that, that we, the war on poverty, one of the reasons why that it's something that, you know, maybe not be cost effective is that politicians of both parties have uh, used uh, expansions to kind of pander to the median voter and win votes. Uh, by offering benefits to people who aren't in, in the bottom decile. Uh, and and that, so we end up spending a trillion dollars a year, uh, but a lot of that's not going for actually for a war on poverty. Oh, well, uh, as an old saying goes, one person's pandering is another person's relief. Uh, the, uh, uh, I could say the same thing uh, in regard to Social Security caps, uh, uh, the income caps uh, 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 for Social Security uh, payments, uh, FDR. Uh, impose that so that it wouldn't be viewed as a socialistic program. Uh, so that, uh, uh, in other words, uh, everybody would pay the up to a certain limit. Uh, and uh, right now, the most popular Social Security reform, according to polls, is to lift the caps. Yet the caps aren't being lifted. So, in other words, politics gets into all this uh, uh, to some degree. Uh, it isn't that necessary sometimes to, in order to build support for something like Medicare Part D? Yeah, right. So, so you couldn't have a drug program for everybody. I mean, for, for just the poor. So you need to have it for everybody. Uh, and that's maybe the cost of having the program. Mm -hmm. well, uh, Jocelyn, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Michael wanted to respond no, to that? I just wanted to add a, a point that's relevant there, another math point, and I'm not an expert in the math either. But there are some tensions within the legacy of the, of the Great Society. Um, and one of them is in 1960, if you look at the figures, about the same percentage of domestic spending went to seniors as went to the young. Okay? That, by some measures right now, is about three times the amount on seniors that we just spend on the young because we created these programs, many of them not means-tested, Medicare and, and others. Um, and we're going to double the number of seniors by 2030. Um, and the math for politicians doesn't add up. At some point, you're straining everything else we want to do 
on equal opportunity, particularly focused on the young, with the direction of certain elements of the great society. And so I think we're going to have to take those tensions seriously moving forward. And you create strange political circumstance in which Democrats uh, are often defending um, systems that really often that, that benefit white and many wealthy people, while we're underfunding many of these other efforts that need to be uh, emphasized to build equal opportunity in our society, particularly for the young. So I think there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, speaking of politics, uh, Jocelyn, uh, having, having been a veteran of the Obama administration and the uh, uh, current uh, Obamacare war, shall we say, uh, that have been going on, there's a, a, a big uh, question about whether the whole notion of government's ability to effectively respond to these massive uh, social problems, uh, that's in question now uh, at the same time that we're observing 50th anniversary of, of the war on poverty. Uh, do you think now is uh, a, a good time for the whole notion of government remedies for a, a problem that's vast? Well, I think it's, it's a critical time um, uh, to really think about what role government can and should play. Um, and I think uh, you know, one of the lessons of the war on poverty is that government has an essential role to play because there's some things that only government can do. I mean, when you start talking about um, inequality and ensuring that um, everybody has an equal opportunity, a fair chance to succeed in the workplace, for example, um, and you think back to what were really the seminal um, strategies put in place to accomplish that goal, that was almost entirely government. Um, we would not have had the advancements for African Americans and people of color and women in the workplace absent um, important um, critical government strategies and then um, first President Johnson and then subsequent administrations really making the investment to um, make those laws real. So I think um, when you look at that history, it's clear that government has a critical role to play. It doesn't mean that um, government is the only solution. I think, you know, the president would say that now. I think President Johnson said it then. Um, and there clearly are a lot of other strategies that ought to be deployed at the same time. It also doesn't mean that government is perfect. Um, any change, particularly big change, whether you're talking about a war on poverty or health care or education, is going to have um, some wins and some losses. That's the essence of what, you know, any sort of, you know, tackling a big problem involves. Um, but you make adjustments and you get it right. You don't abandon it. Um, you don't abandon um, programs that have fundamentally changed the lives of families. You don't abandon something like health care that's critical to the ability of folks to, um, to be secure. Um, you figure out what's not working, and you fix it to make it better. So I think, you know, looking at this current administration, there's a really important role for the administration to play in really tackling not only health care, but also um, making sure that um, uh, um, everybody has an equal chance to um, achieve some level of economic stability for themselves and their, their families. I'd like to ask the entire panel about the uh, odd, unexpected, I would say, gender trends that have occurred over the last half century. Uh, one uh, has been called the feminization of poverty. Uh, we can see more and more of it with uh, single moms in particular. Uh, and uh, that whole debate surrounding that in regard to uh, the uh, role of family as a poverty fighter and uh, at the same time, how do you build family when you've got a lack of jobs and, uh, and increasing poverty? Uh, so uh, uh, that's one aspect. Uh, the other is that, uh, I think you touched on, on, on this, Kevin, the, uh, um, the fact that uh, we're seeing uh, greater advances now for educated women uh, in particular, uh, uh, both uh, in schools uh, now uh, in the, uh, since the early 90s now, uh, Entering freshman women uh, in college are uh, exceeding the performance of uh, male students. And uh, being the father of a young male student just hits me uh, quite personally. But never in any, any case, uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, there's that issue and, and the fact that, that the, the structural changes in the economy have given an advantage to those who uh, do behave well in class, as I've told my son, and, uh, and uh, uh, show a real interest in uh, education. And, and so 
on, on the one hand, we're seeing uh, women doing better than men on, on one level, and then on the other hand, women doing worse than men. Uh, what does this tell us about our current, the whole poverty issue as LBJ foresaw it and what we have seen as a reality after a half century? And, and I'll get a response from anybody on this. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, um, but I'm sure others want to, to comment. Um, I, you know, I think it's, um, uh, in many ways, it illustrates the point um, that uh, Martha started out with, which is the connection between poverty and equality. Um, because the reality is, and this is still true, that when you look at um, earnings and wages um, uh, and the types of jobs that women hold today, um, um, they are disproportionately lower wage jobs. Um, and we still continue to have challenges around um, uh, securing equal pay. And so not surprisingly, um, when you look at um, women uh, who had households, um, uh, you see sort of disproportionate numbers around poverty. And um, uh, I can't remember if it was Martha or Sheldon who made this point. Um, I think it also illustrates the fact that conditions changed. Where we were 50 years ago is not where we are today. That one of the big changes that happened was the influx of women into the workplace. And so it required um, us thinking a little bit about, you know, how do we make sure that as that happens that women also have a fair shot. Um, so it's not simply a challenge around racial equality, it's also gender equality and, and, and putting laws in place that actually help us accomplish that as well. So um, I, I think that dynamic um, um, is a perfect illustration of the continued need to have sort of a dual strategy that focuses on how do we make sure that the jobs that women are in um, actually pay decent wages, but also how do we continue the investment and resources to make sure that they have a fair chance to succeed like everybody else. Anyone else? Go right ahead. It, it, in, in work in progress, it's a nice example of uh, uh, I think that, it, that when we fight a war on poverty, we need to you know, get all the generals in the room and, and be rational about what we're doing. And I think that your uh, discussion of the, the sort of decline in the family and the, and the problems that that creates uh, highlights uh, a work in progress that, I, that I'm working on now that uh, can talk about how unintended design flaws can have seriously negative effects. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has massive marriage penalties. Uh, and so if you take two people with incomes of around 20,000, they each get Medicaid uh, in many states. You have to go around from website to website to see because they what the prices are and what they're, so, so this is why it's still a work in progress because the websites may or may not be correct and so on. But, uh, but, but if they get married and have a family income of 40,000, then they don't and they have to buy insurance. Or if they're in the subsidy range, then the subsidies also have marriage penalties. And, and so the, that the Affordable Care Act will have this side effect of at least encouraging people on paper to not get married, because if they do, uh, then there'll be a very, very high cost in terms of lost benefits. Uh, that kind of thing, again, that this Hamilton Project event that was at a few weeks ago is something that's kind of all over the place uh, in our policies. And I think that we need to be much more rational about how we want to align incentives uh, to encourage uh, family formation rather than discourage it. Is, is, are you advocating a single payer system which wouldn't have those <laughs> disincentives? Sounds like a slide in that way, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to circle back to the 1960s, um, and one of the things that the, the Johnson administration really struggled with then, um, and this is evident in the Monaghan Report, um, and it sort of extends through, is how to think about training women and getting them to work. So some of the first human capital programs that they invested in, they didn't have any for women at all. They didn't even know how to think about training poor girls. That wasn't part of the thing. So it took a lot of work to get them to even think about uh, job training for young women. Now this tension has continued and it's still the case now. The movement from welfare to workfare means that the people who are um, ended up strapped are the people, a lot of single single mothers as a matter of fact. Now child care is uh, expensive. Wages for these women are low. And so moving them from the home into work, I mean, has uh, it, there's obviously an important tension there. If we're interested in increasing resources for kids, it's not clear at all that the financial resources for those kids are going to increase if their moms are actually paying a lot more for childcare. On the other hand, we want to minimize the work disincentives. This is actually an exercise that I give my students in my class on women in the economy. How can we design a program without work disincentives? Um, 
that provides opportunities uh, or increases resources for poor kids? And the answer to the exercise is that it's almost impossible. It's really, really difficult to come up with something that's going to work. So the best suggestion that my students have come up with, and that some of you may think of, is um, these preschool programs that also double as childcare for a lot of these families. But those are enormously expensive. So I think that this is a problem. It's a tension that comes right out of the 1960s, and it hasn't decreased as women's labor force participation has skyrocketed. Good point. Um, there's something else I wanted to say. I want to circle back to this idea that for programs to be poverty reducing, they have to be means tested. And that was something that I really wanted to talk about. So coming back to something that Mike said. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out about Medicare is it's easy just to think about the fact that this is transferring a lot of resources to people who could have paid for care in the first place. But I think that that misses a lot of its important contributions. So I talked about Medicare funded desegregation, right? Medicare gives the federal government a lot of power to change things in hospitals, for instance, or in medical care that we'd like it to affect. Um, we also think um, that Medicare, the availability of Medicare, reduced the possibility of falling into poverty. Think about the era before Medicare. To retire, you lose your employer provided health insurance, right? So you couldn't actually retire with any medical care. And of course, this is the moment in your life when you really need it. So you couldn't retire. And what happens then if you get too sick to work? You also lose your health insurance in this era. So who ends up providing care for a lot of the elderly in the 1960s and before? Their families. Not only do families pay a lot for this medical care, but they also have their aging parents living with them. And they're providing, of course, this is again women's work, a lot of the caretaking in the home for these parents. So a lot of these benefits are not quantified when we're thinking about the value of programs like Medicare. But you can also think that there are much larger effects of programs like that. Um, and the other thing that I highlighted is if you think about what happens when you free up those resources for a lot of American families, they're not using the money to pay for their aging parents' medical bills. Instead, they can use it for things like their kids, sending them to college, and so on and so forth, which reduces dependency on the other types of programs where we like to cut expenditures. So there's a lot broader implications of a lot of this, uh, the programs put into place in the 1960s than we might think. I, by the way, I wouldn't deny any of those implications. I was making a fairly narrow fiscal point oh. over the next 30 years. As larger and larger percentages of our budgets have gone to uh, non-means tested entitlements, it reduces our flexibility to invest in other areas. Um, and that, that's a public policy, right. th that's a measure of public policy priorities. It's also, by the way, a measure of political power. Right. Um, uh, children in America don't have effective lobbies in the same way that uh, the elderly do. Um, and some of those needs are, are, are urgent. Uh, they require public policy. And the flexibility to, to do that becomes much more limited over time on the current path mm -hmm. that, we, that we have for the percentage of our budget that goes to entitlement payments without dramatically increasing the percentage of our economy taken in taxes. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Uh, we have come to the point in our program where you, the audience, get a chance to respond. Uh, we have two microphones uh, out here in the aisle, uh, and uh, we have uh, folks with, uh, with my, well, who will bring a mic to you for that matter. Yeah. Uh, if you will just, uh, 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 do we have some, some people who had some, uh, in case some questions earlier, or should we just uh, uh, go directly to, uh, we do have a couple of folks at the mic right now, so why don't you go ahead. And then uh, sure. those of you who can't make it to the mic, you can hold up your hand, and I'll be happy Thanks. to call on you. So uh, exploring this war analogy, um, we know how difficult it is to fight two-front wars and how that decreases the chance of success. I was around in the 1960s, and though my memory at this age may be a little bit less, I seem to recall Lyndon uh, Johnson talking about us being able to have guns and butter. Sounds like a two-front war to me. If we'd fought the war only domestically and the war on poverty, do you think the outcome would have uh, would been different? Good question. I think, uh, I think there's a famous quant, uh, quote um, with expletives that I won't repeat by <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, basically to that effect. It's saying that the war in Vietnam had starved, I think, he, um, the only woman he'd ever loved. Which by that, he meant his, his domestic war on poverty. And most people would agree that uh, Vietnam was what co crashed his legacy uh, in the end, after all the massive social uh, changes he had made uh, domestically. Uh, so we have a, uh, anybody else want to respond? Uh, or we have some other folks here? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Hi, I'm going to pull this over in part because it's Mr. Gerson I want to see, and he's behind a pole. Um, so and who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if panelists could talk about what you see as the vision for the next step in terms of you know, setting goals, and in particular why I wanted to talk to Mr. Gerson or wanted your response on this is I think on an international scale, there's a lot of interest in the ter a goal of ending extreme poverty on the planet by 2030. And do you see efforts aligning between the U.S. and around the world? Or just generally, if folks could talk about, you know, whether it's cutting poverty in half in 10 years or, or some other measure, what's the next goal and how can we work towards that? Now, Michael, as Martin Luther King said, where do we go from here? Yeah. Well, I hope those are not competitive priorities. That's the... That's some of the difficulty when you look at uh, where Americans would like to cut federal spending. They put at the top um, international aid. Um, by the way, they put third extending unemployment insurance, which is not very popular. Um, you, we, I, I wouldn't have expected that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, globally we've made extraordinary gains against extreme poverty over the last 20 years and the extraordinary gains on global health. Um, and, uh, you know, the, some of this is, I would say, a, a restoration of appropriate confidence in uh, effective outcome-based government. Okay? And I think both sides ideologically need to contribute to that. Um, need to find ways to say uh, there are circumstances in which government can identify problems and, and solve them in modest ways while minimizing unintended consequences. I personally, I, I won't go into it, I think that on international aid, we've seen that in many ways, providing AIDS drugs to millions of people, uh, doing uh, uh, serious work on malaria or a long-term development and other things. And, of course, we need long-term development in the United States as well. Um, and so I hope those aren't competitive priorities. They, off, they are often seen that way. But I think they're related whether you believe that government can take um, limited, effective, outcome-based action. So. This study did mention that uh, the geographic impact, which was touched on earlier, in that uh, uh, we as poor as poor folks are these days, they're better off than poor folks were 100 years ago, or they're better off than poor folks were, or are in the third world, uh, et cetera. Uh, are, are we asking too much of our anti-poverty efforts here in this country? Uh, Jason. I well, um, just wanted to make a, a quick follow-up to Michael's uh, point. I, I've spent most of my um, time as a journalist working on domestic policy, but I've spent a little time dabbling in the world of, uh, uh, of international poverty. Um, and uh, I've been struck by the difference uh, in the um, optimism level of the two communities. You know, if you, um, I, I think that the, the domestic poverty conversation is um, uh, has this kind of you know, overhang of trying to explain why uh, disappointment, whereas um, in the international context, it's uh, it, it, the, the surprise, I think, is that things moved, um, in the, as Michael said, in the last 20 years, um, uh, in many ways, rapidly in the positive direction. So it's, you, I, I'm not sure where to, what to make of it, but it is definitely a, a different tone in the conversation. And I like Michael's phrase, what was it, uh, appropriate um, outcome-based, the restoration of, of confidence in appropriate out based government or you, you get a sense that in, in other words you get a sense that, that something can be done in a way that you don't often get that, that sense uh, in the domestic conversation I thought conservatives were better at catchphrases so uh, there Michael, we'll, we'll work on that one <laughs> um, you know I just wanted to, to uh, respond to the the question because I think um, we get caught up in a lot of the division around the war and poverty um, rather than focusing on where there's commonality and agreement. Um, and one of the things that strikes me the most about the war and poverty is that, you know, it was a big vision. Um, to end the war in poverty is an enormous goal. Um, and it seems to me there's no reason why we can't set a big goal today. 
um, whether it's cutting poverty in half in 10 years or some other equally ambitious goal. Um, the worst thing that can happen, hopefully, is that ma maybe you don't get there, but um, you know you make some progress. And I think it's incumbent upon us to set a big goal um, and to think about how we can work together and to learn from the mistakes of the past. But I think it's important to set a big goal and then to talk about all the different components to making that goal a reality. Education, healthcare, employment, all of those pieces working together. But you know, this, this is an important time, um, and I think we have an opportunity to actually um, do some important things. Can I, question can I just <clears throat> add here, because this discussion of setting a goal reminds me of uh, Tony Blair, and I would refer people to a Russell Sage Foundation book by Jane Waldfogel called Britain's War on Poverty, because he basically declared war on poverty in a President Johnson-style speech, set the government to do it, and cut poverty, child poverty, in half by Britain in 10 years. So it's possible. Now, they have a very different system when you control parliament. You can do what you want, but the conservative government hasn't turned around and rolled back most of those aspects. So if, if one wanted to look at what would be a modern view for America, I think Tony Blair's War on Poverty is a good example. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, I, I was just going to say uh, Sheldon's chart on median income and the gap between uh, male and female really jumped out at me. And, and uh, Jocelyn, you did talk to it a little bit, but given that um, you know the uh, that there is a gap between uh, well, we don't have equal pay for women, and, and that's clear. If we fix that, given how many households are led by women. Uh, you know, what kind of dent would that put in uh, poverty? So I, I, I'll say something about that. So part of the gap between men and women is that they have different skills, right? So there's about a 20, you know, women make about 80% um, of what men do on average, and I think that that's what your figure was showing. So part of that is a skill gap, um, and some of that skill gap reflects women making different choices about how much they want to invest in their careers versus family. But the other part is something that um, we could certainly uh, work to remedy and I think has been changing, though um, the convergence and the gender gap has really stalled in the last decade. Yeah, let, let me just add to that. Uh, you know, my, my personal experience having been kind of like a, a, a baby in the uh, war, during the war on poverty, I was able to, uh, because of a lot of the things that happened, I entered IBM in like 1976, and I will tell you that they had to adjust my salary three times across my career, all the way up to 1990 because of inequities. Mm -hmm. And the, the issue there is it's a one-time shot, so the cumulative impact there is, is not even noted. I see the same thing happening with women right now. I think um, that's an excellent point, and that's part of what I was going to to say. I mean, there clearly are, um, you know, there's there's a lot of conversation you could have about the pay gap and why the pay gap exists and what it looks like. I think that, um, you know, the data that I've seen is that even when you control for things like differences in education and um, and others' uh, seniority experience, there's still, you know, a, a gap, and I think that's the, the point that you're raising. And if you look at research, like research has been done by the Institute for Women's Policy Research, um, uh, the, the issue is not simply the gap that occurs, you know, at the start of your career, but how that builds over time, um, and that eventually, um, you know, I think they they say it's three hundred or four hundred thousand um, dollars in terms of income over time, and then that impacts not only what you've earned but also your retirement. So I think. Um, it, efforts to correct the pay gap would go a long way towards um, creating greater economic stability for families generally because the other dynamic is that women increasingly are the sole or primary breadwinners in their families. Uh, you know, CAP has done research on, uh, you know, four in 10 um, uh, families now women are the sole or primary breadwinners. So it's not simply a women's issue, it's a family issue, um, an overall economic issue. So, uh, you know, I think, again, it's sort of, um, uh, 
shows very vividly the connection between poverty and equality because notwithstanding the, the laws that we have in place around equal pay, um, if you ask women, they will tell you that one of the top things, challenges they face is equal pay. Um, and for, from my perspective, we shouldn't be focusing on whether or not there's a pay gap, whether or not you know we have challenges around equal pay. We should be focusing on how can we ensure better enforcement? How can we ensure that we make sure that when that that folks just have a fair chance? Um, and what sort of steps can we make sure we can we can put in place to make sure that when women apply for jobs that they're being offered the same sorts of salaries as their male counterparts? How do we give women better information? How can we create greater transparency? in salaries so that there's not, you know, the lead better phenomenon of finding out 20 years later you were being paid less for decades and, and then somebody secretly gives you a note. I mean, these are sort of things that are, you know, sort of no-brainers. Um, we spend a lot of time debating, but there ought to be a way to um, give people better information to make sound choices so that at least they have a fair chance to be paid fairly for their work. We have Thank two you. more people at the mic who might be able to give us more insight. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, one of the panelists referred to uh, poverty today, um, not no one wanting to go back to the poverty uh, 50 years ago and that type of poverty. And yet, when you look at the fact that uh, poor people have, are consumers, just like the whole country is, they buy things and yet they uh, ingest empty calories and, and then uh, end up with obesity and those types of problems, how do you then talk uh, or explain that kind of thing about, well, that poverty isn't the same. I think people were, in some ways, more healthy. And we do have a, a health system that keeps even um, uh, people with diabetes and all those kinds of things uh, with medicines to keep them alive, yet, um, well, we didn't have them 50 years ago. So how, I, I, it's hard for me then to understand you know, the statement that was made on that. You worked on the first lady's obesity program, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I well, did. Well, how, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I, I, uh, obviously I feel I feel very strongly that uh, it's an important initiative um, and one that uh, uh, um, did a couple of things and importantly sort of talked about not only health from a poverty perspective, but also um, the health of kids more broadly. Um, uh, um, and has made an important contribution to um, continuing the progress that was beginning but hadn't quite um, materialized around reducing childhood obesity. Um, um, I think um, one of the interesting things about her initiative is that it makes clear the connection between health and nutrition and poverty um, and, and doesn't talk about them as mutual exclusive things, but also makes clear that, um, um, that health shouldn't just be the... Um, the province of people who have resources. Um, you know, one of the first things that we did in 2009 is we went to a soup kitchen here called Miriam's Kitchen that focuses on healthy eating to make the point that that having access to healthy food was something that shouldn't be um, um, exclusively for folks who have resources to buy nice, um, expensive organic food, but is something that is inextricably linked to, to you know, our nation's values around. Um, um, uh, 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 human integrity. Uh, uh, so I think that those those things are incredibly important um, today um, and are important investments to make. Another question or comment? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sorry. So as you'll tell from my accent, uh, the Tony Blow example was a, a helpful one to hear. Uh, having just been kind of part of that debate in the UK, one of the things we, we learnt uh, with kind of some of New Labour's policies around the New Deal for kind of youth unemployment and things like that was there are, because poverty is ultimately a personal thing, there are people components of poverty that can't really be fixed by government and government isn't necessarily the best to address. So one of the things was soft skills, looking at those things like conflict resolution, punctuality and things that employers say they desperately need that are actually barriers to employment that are far harder to, I mean, you could pass a law saying everyone needs to be on time, but uh, I think that would be a bit more challenging. Uh, so my question is really, when we think about poverty and the people component of poverty, what are, if any, of the ways that government can actually help 
kind of create a climate for other people forming institutions to be able to address poverty more effectively, doing things that maybe they're better placed to do than government might be, though recognizing government has an important role in kind of creating that climate? Mm. Very good question. I, I, this is something that, that I've been working a lot on going back to this work that folks might have seen that I've been doing on work sharing that um, that there are a lot of innovative programs uh, in other countries that try to encourage uh, private entrepreneurs to enter with a sort of creative spirit into this space. Uh, in uh, Germany, if uh, the government uh, job training uh, programs have failed you uh, for a year and you still don't have a job, then you're eligible uh, for a program where private firms uh, can jump in and try to help you find a job. And if they succeed by a metric where you're getting a paycheck for an established amount of time, then they get a big cash bonus. Uh, and, and I think that um, thinking about, again, if you look at the, the terrible uh, evaluations that we've seen in the academic literature of, of the job training programs that we have uh, in, in the US, I think that, that kind of, copying that kind of program is a key area of opportunity going forward. Uh, we are almost out of time, so uh, let's make this a, a wrap-up question here. Uh, Michael, go right ahead. Sure. I, I think if you look at the material that Robert Putnam is, is talking about and talking about gap, the gaps that cause many of these gaps of opportunity, they're gra gaps of parental time and investment, gaps in social trust, gaps in community involvement, gaps in religious participation, all which predict problems uh, for mobility in the future. And those are, have to be solved by mediating institutions. The, the, I think the real question is whether you can have, as a supplement to government doing its job in a variety of areas, which is absolutely essential, whether it can find creative ways to involve other value-based institutions in society to help address these, to catalyze, to essentially encourage roles that it can't do very well itself. Um, and that, I think, is an area where I hope, you know, Marco Rubio is speaking on the, a new war on poverty this afternoon. Conservatives have begun a more virtuous uh, competition on these ideas. Maybe that's an area where conservatives can contribute to this debate in a substantive way. Jason, uh, you want to add, add to that? Uh, uh, in terms of, well, especially in terms of... Uh, the uh, political debate right now. Do you think we're moving toward some kind of a new consensus where where uh, uh, new conservatives like like Michael uh, uh, are coming together uh, with uh, to to update the old uh, LBJ uh, agenda? I'm, I'm certainly no uh, expert on uh, where conservatives are, are going in their debate about poverty, but uh, my impression would be no. I mean, what I hear from Michael sounds uh, very different from what I hear from House Republicans. It is very different from House Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe what we need, Michael, is, is a consensus among Republicans. Yeah. First then... well, I mean, the opportunity, though, is the 2016 election, because the dynamics of a, of a national appeal on the common good are very different from the congressional dynamics of, of you know, districts that are, you know, predominantly either conservative or liberal and sorted in a, in a kind of non-productive way. That's been, always been... The, the situation. So that's my hope. You, you know, you had Bill Clinton campaigning on the new covenant, talking about responsibility and opportunity. Right. You had, we in 2000 talked about compassion and conservatism and trying to involve mediating institutions in, in drug treatment or, other, you know, other things. There are, is a space here for an appeal to the common good by either left or right that takes into account these lessons of the great society. Well, uh, Kevin, as, as a veteran of three campaigns, uh, a presidential, <laughs> uh, well, presidential campaigns, five? Well, that's true. I lost count. Uh, but <laughs> you see, looking forward uh, here, uh, any hope for that sort of a consensus nationally? I, I think that, that, that the quickest way, because I know we're about out of time to answer that question, is go back and look at uh, President Obama's speech right after he won the Iowa caucuses and compare it to a typical stump speech of President Bush when he was talking about com compassionate conservatism. And you'll see that there were many, many themes uh, that were quite common between the two speeches. Uh, and I think that uh, having an ear uh, for what Americans want to hear uh, was a gift that both 
successful politicians had. They won two presidential elections. So my guess is that whoever wins the next one will go back to the themes that they played, which are similar to the things that Michael's talking about. Uh, and uh, it's not necessarily there's a lot of pressure for that in congressional races. Uh, but at the national level, I think that we've got four elections in a row where people who played to those themes won. Thank you. Uh, uh, jo uh, Jocelyn, uh, you see hope and change in the future for our presidential camp uh, for our uh, presidential debate in the 2016 on the poverty issue in particular. Um, well, I'm always positive about hope and change. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I like those terms. Um, you know, I think um, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, with an, uh, um, being very cognizant of the point uh, that Jason raised about the current politics. But, you know, I think um, there's a lot of opportunity um, uh, of folks of goodwill on all sides of the aisle to really think critically about the issues that we're talking about. And to me, the, um, you know, the opportunity is to create the space for the conversation. Um, and I go back to the point that, that Martha alluded to earlier. A lot of the progress that we're talking about in the war on poverty, um, they were not safe choices. They, they were difficult choices. They created controversy, um, uh, particularly around uh, challenges around racial equality. And so I, I think it will be true that as we talk about different programmatic responses, that there will be a strong opposition. Um, and so what we need to do collectively and together is to create a safe space for people to have those conversations. Um, you know, when people, uh, you know, go against the, the, perhaps the prevailing mood of their party or folks on their side of the aisle, that um, there's still a safe space to talk about how do we actually invest in, in, in kids and low-income families and um, ensure the safety net, that we don't abandon all of those things that have helped make progress. So, you know, with that understanding, I, I, I'm always optimistic. Thank you. I want to invite Michael Laracy, the director of the Anna E. Casey Foundation Policy Reform and Advocacy. Uh, uh, please uh, uh, give us your closing remarks. And thank, thank you, Clarence. Thank you very much for having us. Um, you know, when we started planning this about four or five months ago, I had pretty high expectations. I thought this could be important and uh, and significant, uh, and uh, this panel has really exceeded all my expectations. We saw this as an opportunity to reevaluate, revisit America's uh, most uh, notable effort to reduce poverty and promote opportunity, and to s learn lessons, see how we could guide our, our, our future policy efforts. And I think uh, the book, which is really quite good, really buy it, it's well worth it, um, and this discussion achieved that. Um, uh, the extent of the consensus here among some very diverse people uh, politically was striking, and the areas of disagreement were illuminating and I think important. Uh, you know, I, I, when there was disagreement, I think it was consequential um, and significant. So, uh, you know, you really uh, exceeded all the expectations, and I had high ones knowing almost all of you well. Um, I want to put a, a word in about one of uh, the project, this effort's uh, co-sponsors, Spotlight on Poverty and Opportunity. Uh, it's a platform uh, designed to highlight the challenges and, uh, that vulnerable members of our society face and to try to cultivate the type of bipartisan, uh, cross-ideological uh, discussion that we're having today um, and focus on solutions. Uh, Spotlight is managed by the CLASP, the Center for Law and Social Policy, and staffed run by the Freeman Consulting Group, the Hatcher Group, and NAKTV. Um, we've been at this, Spotlight's been at it for about uh, six years now, um, and you know, it, it, we uh, tag ourselves as the source for news, idea, and action, and I think we've seen in this period a lot of progress. I agree with the, the sort of consensus here this afternoon that a lot has been changed. I follow the newspapers every day, and anybody who gets my emails every morning knows it, um, and I really have seen a significant change in the recent months in the discussion around poverty and opportunity, um, and I don't think that's an accident. I think there's a lot of work that people at this day are doing, and a lot of other folks in this room I see, you know, I see a lot of people contributing to that, so I'm optimistic. I am very optimistic about what's going to be happening in the next couple of years if we can only deal with Congress. Um, I think we'd really be in great shape. I want to um, acknowledge and thank our two co-sponsors, uh, the National Poverty Center at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. 
um, and its director of communications, uh, Laura Lee, and of course, uh, Dean Susan Collins. I want to acknowledge and thank the Russell Sage Foundation, especially its fantastic new president, Sheldon, <laughs> um, and its director of communications, David uh, Haproff. Um, and I'd like to thank all of the panelists uh, uh, here today. Uh, Clarence, thank you so much for coming out. Um, and the authors uh, of the uh, sections in this book who really did, made some wonderful contributions. And of course, I want to thank all of you for coming out and being part of this discussion. It's a discussion that's going to be ongoing. Um, and one way to uh, be part of it is to visit spotlightonpoverty.org uh, uh, and engage in the discussions there. We, we offer exclusive commentaries from folks on the left and the right. We uh, are a portal to everything that's happening on poverty and opportunity. So it's a good way to keep informed and be part of what I think will be a, a very exciting year. Uh, so thanks again, and let's stay in touch. Thank you.